In this module, we shall study about return to scale and long run cost curves. In the long run, all factors of production are variable. A firm can increase its output by increasing the quantity of all inputs, that is the scale of operation. The returns that are generated are called returns to scale. The law of return to scale examines the behavior of output. It explains input-output relationship in the long run. After starting this module, you shall be able to know about returns to scale through isocons, understand about product lines and isoclines, learn about economies and diseconomies of scale, derive the long run cost curve. We shall now understand about the returns to scale. In the long run, the study of production function is concerned with the law of returns to scale. When all factors are changed in the same proportion, keeping their proportions constant, the scale of output will also change. The response of the output to these changes in inputs is called returns to scale. Technology is assumed to remain constant while studying the returns to scale. There are three possibilities of these output response. When the producer increases the output in a given proportion, that is the output may increase more than proportionately, just proportionately or less than proportionately. Suppose in the production function, there are two variable inputs that is capital K and labor L. Then the production function can be expressed as Q is a function of K and L. Q denotes the quantity of output produced. Now suppose both the factor inputs that is K and L are increased in proportion M and the total output increases in proportion L. The new production function can be expressed as NQ is equal to function of MK and ML. The proportion N that is the response of the output may be equal to greater than or less than M that is the change in factor proportion. Accordingly, the stages of the law of returns to scale can be first, if n is greater than m, the increase in quantity of commodity produced is greater than the proportional increase in the input units. This is a situation of increasing returns to scale. Thus, if factors of production are doubled and the quantity of commodity produced that is output is more than doubled, then there is increasing returns to scale. Second, if n is equal to m, the increase in the quantity of commodity purchased is equal to the proportional increase in the input units. This is a situation of constant returns to scale. Thus, if factors of production are doubled and the quantity of commodity produced that is output is also doubled then there is constant returns to scale. Third, if n is less than m, the increase in the quantity of commodity purchased is less than the proportional increase in the input units. This is a situation of diminishing returns to scale. Thus, if factors of production are doubled and the quantity of commodity produced that is output is less than double, then there is diminishing returns to scale. Here, the three possibilities of the response of output to a proportionate change in all the inputs are expressed by the concept of isocons. Graphically, the returns to scale may be expressed by the shifts of the isocons on a product line. Product line and isocline. A product line shows the physical movement from one isocon to another in response to changes in quantity of input. It is independent of the prices or factors of production, does not show any actual choice of expansion which is based on the prices of factors. Rather, it shows the technically feasible paths of expanding output. If all the factors are variable, that is in the long run, the product line passes through the origin. If only one factor is variable and all other factors are constant, that is in the short run, the product line is a straight line parallel to the axis of the variable factor. Figure depicts an isocline for a family of isocons that are homogeneous. 
such that the locus of the point at which the product line touches the respective isocont has MRS which is equal at all points of tangency. Thus, in case of homogeneous isocons, isocline will be a straight line arising from the origin of uniform slope. In next figure, we have depicted an isocline which is based on the family of isocons which are non-homogeneous. In this case, the point at which the product line touches the respective isocont should have the MRS. However, because the isocons are non-homogeneous, the same MRS is not achieved along the same straight line arising from the origin. The slope of such an isocont would be varying and hence isocline itself would be twiddly. If the product line substance equal angles with the axis, that is at which the MRS of factors is constant, then it is called an isocline. The isocline are straight line through the origin. If the production function is homogeneous and if the production function is non-homogeneous, the shape of the isocline will be twiddly. Returns to scale for a homogeneous production function. OS, a ray from the origin, represents increase in the scale. Along isocline, the ration between labor and capital remains the same, though their absolute amount keep rising. The technically possible alternative paths of expanding output is shown by this ray. Next, increasing returns to scale. The proportion of increase in output is more than the proportion of increase in all inputs. The distance between consecutive multiple isocons along the isocline OS decreases in case of increasing returns to scale. It means an equal increase in output is obtained by smaller and smaller increments in inputs. Here, AB is greater than BC is greater than CD. In case of increasing returns to scale, if the firm wants to double its output, it requires less than double inputs. The following figure shows increasing returns to scale. Next, diminishing returns to scale. The proportion of increase in output is less than the proportion of increase in all inputs. The distance between consecutive multiple isocons along the isocline OS increases. In case of diminishing returns to scale, it means an equal increase in output is obtained by larger and larger increments in inputs. Here, BC is greater than AB and less than CD. Thus, in case of diminishing returns to scale, if the firm wants to double its output, it requires more than double inputs. The following figure shows diminishing returns to scale. Next, constant returns to scale. The proportion of increase in output is same as the proportion of increase in all inputs. The distance between consecutive multiple isocons along the isocline OS remains same. In case of constant returns to scale, it means an equal increase in output is obtained by equal increments in input. Here, AB is equal to BC is equal to CD. Thus, in case of constant returns to scale, if the firm wants to double its output, it requires double inputs. The following figure shows constant returns to scale. In a single production function, the three phases of returns to scale occurs in the order of increasing constant and diminishing returns to scale. In the long run, as firm continues its production, eventually diminishing returns to scale sets in after passing through the phases of increasing and constant returns to scale. Let us now discuss the economies and diseconomies of scale. Economies of scale in order to earn more profits, a business firm expands its scale of operations. The large scale of production provides many economies to the firm by helping in reducing the cost of production and increasing its productive efficiency. Such economies that occur to a firm due to increase in all factors of production or increase in number of firms in the industry is called the economies of scale, internal economies, and external economies are the two types of such economies. 
internal economies the economies that accrue to a firm due to increase in its plant size or due to increase in the number of its plants are referred to as the internal economies of scale these economies are independent of the actions of other firms and accrue to a firm largely because of its own efforts it means that the firm do not share the advantage of these economies with its rival firms intra plant economies of scale arise due to increase in the size of a single plant whereas inter plant economies of scale arise due to increase in the number of plants this shows that the internal economies of scale are further categorized as the intra plant and inter plant economies of scale in internal economies of scale the economic advantage to a firm proportionately larger than the increment in factor inputs thus causing the increasing returns to scale these economies are different from firm to firm and are peculiar to each firm such economies of scale determines the shape of long run average cost curve by reducing it and the process of cost reduction continues till such economies are fully exhausted some of the internal economies of scale are as follows first technical economies technical economies are the economies which accrue due to the capacity of larger firms being able to use more efficient techniques of production and the fact that larger plants are often cheaper to run it includes a economies due to superior technique larger firms are able to install specialized machines though the fixed cost of these machines may be very high but the average cost will be much lower as the total cost will be spread over a large scale of production therefore the larger firm enjoys the benefit of superior techniques of production b economies due to linked processes instead of purchasing the materials and other inputs from outside suppliers the firm can decide to produce these inputs itself similarly by taking up the marketing function of selling and distribution of its own products the firm can save the expenses on intermediaries thus by doing this a large firm can enjoy the benefits from backward and forward integration of processes c economies by using the by products a large firm can achieve more economies by using the waste of one product as the by product of another product for example the waste left after manufacturing the sugar can be used as the by product for producing paper by installing a plant for this purpose d economies of reserve capacity when the firms operate at large scale they have built in reserve capacity in their plants machinery and other equipments by this these firms are in a better position to meet the changes that arises in demand and avoid disruption due to breakdown of machinery etc second marketing economies marketing economies refers to advantages acquired by a firm due to purchase of inputs at cheaper prices and sale of finished goods at the highest prices these arise due to a economies of purchase a large firm is able to buy raw materials and other factors of production in bulk quantities because of this it can obtain concessions from transport and railways companies also large firms generally hire experienced persons to deal with buy of raw material b economies of sale a large firm can reduce its selling cost by employing highly experienced staff who purchase and sell on behalf of the firm in favorable conditions of the market also large firm is able to take up more advertising activity to increase the sales third financial economies a large firm with a large asset base and high credit worthiness in the market is able to obtain loans from the banks and financial institutions at easy and cheaper rates it can also obtain loans from private sources small firms are not able to get such opportunities fourth risk bearing economies there are general and particular risk which every firm has to face for its existence small firms are not in a position to bear such risk and thus go into liquidation on the other hand 
large firms are not only able to observe such risk but also diversify their output, sources of supply, market and manufacturing process. Fifth, labor economies. Higher degree of specialization and division of labor becomes possible due to increase in scale of production. This specialization and division of labor makes the labor perfect in their work which in turn helps in reducing the wastage of time in moving from one job to another and also in changing tools which results in higher efficiency and productivity in the firm causing the increasing returns to scale. In other words, the reduce in labor cost per unit helps in achieving the increasing returns to scale in the organization. Next, external economies. External economies are the advantages that are generated outside the firm. These economies arise to a firm when there is an expansion of an industry. The firms are not required to make any individual cost reduction efforts. All firms of an industry can enjoy these benefits. The following are the different kinds of external economies. First, economies of concentration. Economies of concentration arises when a number of firms producing the same products are concentrated in a particular area. The following economies arises. A. Availability of more and better skilled laborers saves the cost of training. B. Availability of better financial facilities at cheaper cost. C. Availability of better and cheaper transportation and communication facilities. D. Availability of better marketing facilities. Second, economies of information. Economies of information arise to a firm as all the necessary and pivotal information regarding output, labor, profit, etc. are easily available without doing any efforts. If a firm is situated in a remote area, it is very difficult to know the conditions of the market. But when large number of firms are concentrated in a particular area, they start a bulletin or information paper that gives all essential statistics. This leads to reduction in time and cost. Third, economies of disintegration. Economies of disintegration arise due to localization of industries. A single firm cannot produce adequate wastage or byproducts to enable specialized firm to use them. But if a number of firms are concentrated at one place, then it is possible that more specialized firms are using byproducts. Next is diseconomies of scale. Diseconomies of scale are the disadvantages or difficulties that arise to a firm when it expands the scale of operations beyond the optimum capacity. It results in increased cost of production which gives rise to decreasing returns to scale. There are two types of diseconomies. Internal diseconomies. Internal diseconomies refers to the disadvantages that increases the production cost when output level increases beyond the certain limit. These diseconomies are first, technical diseconomies. When the production is increased beyond the optimum capacity, then technical diseconomies will emerge out. Further, high maintenance cost, heavy losses in case of an accident, and lack of availability of technical experts are some restraining factors that may cause decreasing return to scale. Second, financial diseconomies. When the finance is secured beyond an optimum scale, then financial diseconomies will emerge out. It results in concentration of income and wealth and pressure on firms to show their creditworthiness. Third, risk bearing diseconomies. The risk of the firm increase with the expansion in the scale of production. An error in the decision making by the sales manager or production manager may adversely affect sale or production resulting in losses. Fourth, managerial diseconomies. Managerial diseconomies arise due to lack of skilled and efficient management. When the output level exceeds the optimum point, then manager faces the problem of control and coordination. This adversely affects the operational efficiency. Next, external diseconomies. When an industry expands, the prices of various factors of production like raw materials, 
capital, labor etc. rises because of its growing demand. There may be a shortage of power, transport, labor, raw materials and equipments due to localization of industries. The per unit cost rises due to such diseconomies. The following are the examples of external diseconomy. First, the concentration of an industry in a particular area pollutes the environment which creates health hazards for consumers. Second, the localization of an industry puts heavy pressure on transport system. This results in delay in transportation of raw materials and finished goods. Third, the prices of factors of production rise due to intense competition among the firms. Next, moving on to the long run cost curves. According to the traditional theory, the short run cost curves are U shaped. In the short run, many factors of production are fixed, but in the long run, all factors are assumed to turn variable. The long run cost curves are also called the planning curve as it guides the entrepreneurs to guide their future expansion of output. Long run cost curves are derived from the short run cost curves. The long run average cost curve is the envelope of many short run average cost curves with each short run average total cost curve tangent to the long run average cost curve at a single point corresponding to a single output quantity. Assume that a firm at a particular point of time with a given state of technology can adopt three methods of production. These three production methods corresponds to different plant size, small plant, medium plant and large plant. The small plant operates with cost denoted by SAC1, the medium plant cost denoted by SAC2 and the large plant cost is denoted by SAC3. The firm will choose the small plant if it plans to produce output Q1. Similarly, if the firm wishes to produce Q2 units of output, it will choose SAC2 and with Q3 units of output, the firm will choose SAC3. Suppose the firm is producing Q1 with small size plant, but its demand increases gradually. The cost will be lower up to the level of Q1, but beyond this point, the cost starts increasing. Now, if the firm reaches the level of Q1, the firm has two options, either continue to produce with the same plant or can resort to the medium size plant. At this point, the decision of the entrepreneur depends not only on the cost but also on the firm's expectations about its future demand. If the firm expects that its demand will expand beyond Q1, then it is better for the firm to install medium size plant because the output larger than Q1 can be produced with lower cost only with the medium size plant. Similar decisions holds at the output level of Q2. Now we assume that there is not only three plant but infinite number of plant sizes with given state of technology, each suitable for a certain level of output. With this we get a continuous curve which is the planning long run average cost curve of the firm. Each point on this curve shows the minimum cost of producing the corresponding level of output. On the basis of this curve, the firm takes the decision about what plan to set up in order to produce the expected level of output at the minimum cost. That is why this curve is known as the planning curve of the firm. In the traditional theory of the firm, the LRAC curve is often called the envelope curve because it envelops the SRC curves. The shape of this curve reflects the law of returns to scale. Initially, due to the economies of scale, as the plant size increases, the unit cost of production decreases. But the economies of scale exist only up to a certain size of plant, which is known as the optimal plant size. As per the traditional theory, with the optimum plant size, all the possible economies of scale are fully exploited. If the size of plant increases beyond this optimum size, the diseconomies of scale starts arising because of the managerial inefficiencies. The turning up of the LSE curve is due 
to the managerial diseconomies of scale. On the LSE curve, each point shows the least unit cost for producing the corresponding level of output. Any point above the LSE curve shows the higher cost of producing the corresponding level of output. Any point below the LSE curve is desirable because it shows the lower unit cost but it is not achievable with the current state of technology and the prevailing prices of the factors of production. LMC shows the change in long run total cost per unit due to change in output. The long run marginal cost curve LMC is derived from short run marginal cost curve SMC. It is derived from the intersection point of the SMC with the vertical lines drawn from the tangency point of corresponding SSE and LSE curves. If the firm wants to produce Q1 level of output, it will operate at point A, the point of tangency of LSE and SSE1. From this point, a vertical line is drawn which intersect the SMC1 at point A1. A1 will show one point on the LMC curve because for the output level Q1, LSE is tangent to SSC1, then LMC must be equal to SMC1. If Q2 level of output is produced, it will operate at point B, the point of tangency of LSE and SSE2. From this point, a vertical line is drawn which intersect the SMC2 at point B1. B1 will show another point of the LMC curve because for the output level Q2, LSE is tangent to SAC2, then LMC must be equal to SMC2. Finally, if Q3 level of output is produced, it will operate at point C, the point of tangency of LSE and SSE3. From this point, a vertical line is drawn which intersect the SMC3 at point C1. C1 will show another point of the LMC curve because of the same reason explained above. The LMC curve is obtained by joining points A1, B1, C1. In the modern theory of the firm, the cost curve is roughly I-shaped. This is due to the reduction in cost with increases in output. In long run, the costs are divided into two heads. First, production cost. Second, managerial cost. Production cost. As the scale of production increases, the production cost depicts a tendency to fall steeply in the beginning and gradually thereafter. This is due to the technical economies of large scale production. These economies are substantial in the beginning but stabilize thereafter at a certain minimum scale as soon as the technical economies get exhausted. If a new technology is introduced in production, it must be cheaper to operate at a higher level of output. Similarly, same economies can be achieved with the existing technology at the higher level of output. For example, when inputs are purchased in bulk quantity, they may lead to substantial savings for the firm due to quantity discounts on bulk purchases. Similarly, if the firm reaches a certain size lower, repair cost may be attained. Next, managerial cost. Managerial cost vary with the size of the plant as there are specific organizational administrative setup appropriate for the smooth operating of that plant. Also, there are various levels of management each with its appropriate kind of management techniques. Each management technique is appropriate for a range of output. When the size of the plant is small, the managerial cost falls with expansion of the output. But when the size of the plant is large, the managerial cost falls up to a certain plant size and thereafter it may rise very slowly at a very large scale of output. Hence, at every scale of production, the production cost falls smoothly while the managerial cost rises but very slowly. The fall in production cost is more than offsets the rise in the managerial cost. Therefore, at very large scale of output, the LRAC curve falls smoothly or remains constant and the chances of long run average cost to rise is completely ruled out. Let us now recapitulate what we have learned so far. All the factors of production are variable in the long run. When all factors are changed in the same proportion, 
keeping their proportions constant, the scale of output will also change. The response of the output to these changes in inputs is called returns to scale. There are three possibilities of these output response when the producer increases the input in a given proportion. When output increases more than proportionately, it is called increasing return to scale. When output increases less than proportionately, it is called decreasing returns to scale. And when output increase just proportionately, it is called constant returns to scale. A product line shows the physical movement from one isocon to another in response to changes in quantity of inputs. If the product line substance equal angles with the axis, that is, at which the MRS of factors is constant, then it is called an isocline. Economies that occurs to a firm due to increase in all factors of production or increase in number of firms in the industry is called the economies of scale. The economies that accrue to a firm due to increase in its plant size or due to increase in the number of its plant are referred to as the internal economies of scale. These economies are independent of the actions of other firms and accrue to a firm largely because of its own efforts. External economies arise to a firm when there is an expansion of an industry. The firms are not required to make any individual cost reduction efforts. Diseconomies of scale are the disadvantages or difficulties that arise to a firm when it expands the scale of operations beyond the optimum capacity. Long run cost curves are derived from the short run cost curves. Thank you.